Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. All right. I am here with my friend, Michael Elsner, and I can't believe I haven't had you on the show yet. I know I had you on my summit, but I was thinking, gosh, I need to have him on the show, especially because he's got this awesome video series out right now that I will have already given you a link for at this point. So I want to make sure you guys know to go grab that. But we're going to talk a little bit about his experience with licensing, working with students, you know, what's in the video series, all that stuff. And just to, just a real quick, Michael, if anyone here doesn't know you, I know many of you in my audience know him because I've been telling you about him for the past year, but just give them a super quick, like how you got into licensing and what you, just the highlight reel of what you've done with licensing up to now. (laughs) Well, the, the, the short story is, um, oh, by the way, thank you for having me on. This is going to be a lot of fun. I'm happy to be here. The short story is that I got into licensing really by accident because I didn't know that it existed. You know, so in the 90s and, and through the 2000s, I was uh, always pursuing, I, I grew up in upstate New York. I left New York in, in the late 90s. I moved to Nashville. I was pursuing, you know, the artist path. I played in a band in New York for you know about four years. We did a bunch of records and had some success there. And then then it was time to move to the next thing. So I moved to Nashville. And you know, at that point I was, you know, obviously advanced my career and, and and get a publishing deal. And I've always been a band guy, so I was looking to get into a group. And I was always the main songwriter in my bands, though, you know, but I'm not a front guy. So I was looking to, you know, form a group based around a lot of the songs I was writing and get a publishing deal and got turned down by I mean, everyone for about four and a half years. And then I made it out to California in, in 2003. I thought, well, I'm, I've tried it in Nashville. Nothing's happened in Nashville. And a lot of it too was I wasn't writing country music, you know. Went out to, to Los Angeles in 2003 with a pretty good collection of songs, you know. And I got there and I, I landed a gig on a TV show. Because I, I, I grew up, I spent a lot of time in studios, uh, you know, uh, um, in my early 20s. So I became very comfortable in the studio. I, as a guitar player, I was really focused on being a, session player as well. So I landed a gig on a TV show and I, and through that process of working with the composer, I met a music supervisor and um, I had no idea, of course, what they did, but uh, I learned very quickly what they did. And this is 2003. So what Uh, TV show was that that you were on? Well, the the first gig that I got was playing guitar on The Young and the Restless. Oh, that's fantastic. (laughs) And then that led to like my first movie, which was Ella Enchanted with Anne Hathaway and, and, and whatnot. So that, that opened up a lot of doors. And then I you know, started meeting these music supervisors. And then I got my first break, as far as a song goes, when I was working on a show called Cold Case. Oh, I and, love that show. Yeah, Cold Case on CBS. And I gave my CD to uh, the supervisor for that show. And two weeks later, I had my first song placement. And, I, and it was a song that I was really proud of. It was one of the, it was actually, that particular song was a song that I thought, I took it around Nashville. I played it for every publisher. And I remember thinking, if I get turned down, if they turn me down from this song, I cannot do anything more in this town. And I did the rounds and I got turned down. And so that's when I was like, okay, it's time to try my hand somewhere else. And wouldn't you know it, you know, the very first song I got placed when I got out to Los Angeles was that song that I got turned down <laughs> in, in, in Nashville. And, um, and that was my first placement. And I received, it was a featured vocal placement at the end of one of the episodes. They played it for like two minutes and uh, like 20 seconds, something like that. And it was a featured vocal. And uh, the, the payment that I received for it, I paid my rent for months. Oh. And, that, and I thought, oh my gosh, what is this? And then that led to a second placement. And my world just started changing. And that's really how it happened. And again, through, through the, yeah, I kept pursuing the artist thing, of course. I was playing in a band all the way up until 2011. And uh, did a bunch of records with that group. And I always joke that we were the most successful failure because our songs, we did three records. Our songs were on so many different shows and films. But again, now at that point, we were, we were meeting with record labels and, and A&R people starting around 2007, 2008, into 2009. 
And of course, if you remember what was going on during that time, everything was going down, you know, not only was the record label, the industry going down, but then we were going into a recession. And so now, you know, labels were, were putting the freeze on, on hiring or assigning people and whatnot. So it couldn't have been the worst time to really pursue that and have the traction that we were having with all the placements. Uh, Cause we had some really great meetings, but still nothing came of it. But yet we were getting so many placements and after a couple of years of really just getting you know working so hard at that and then of course just not seeing that come to fruition I, I landed a bunch of gigs on some tv shows i became i composed for two seasons of american idol and then that led to a bunch of other shows like the sing-off and a lot of these competition shows and then that ultimately led to me starting to write film trailers uh, and at that point i thought why am i killing myself pursuing this artist thing, which has been so really depressing, <laughs> you know, always getting turned down. But yet everything that I was doing in the licensing world was gladly accepted. It was welcomed with open mm -hmm. arms and I was getting such a great response and I was able to write so many different styles. And I thought, actually, you know what, realistically, I'm actually accomplishing my goals that I wanted to accomplish musically by getting into licensing because, you know, my goal was to make a living as a musician. And I, and I thought that that meant having a record deal and having videos and touring the world and, you know, all, all the traditional music industry path related aspects of that. But what I realized was through licensing, I actually had so much more artistic freedom. I was working in an industry that really valued what I was doing. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I just enjoyed that path more. So I was, for a couple of years, I had this, it was like this fight back and forth where I really wanted that record deal, but I was fighting and clawing my way in that side of the industry. But yet in the license, you know, and in, in, in getting a lot of rejection, but yet in the licensing world, it was just a great group of people to be around who enjoyed what I was able to deliver to them. And they would call me and they'd thank me and then they'd offer me other opportunities. And it was just this weird, like, you know, I guess you could say like maybe like a yin and yang, although that might not be the best analogy until I finally had to go, okay, I, I, this is stupid. Why am I fighting this other side? I just need to accept the beauty. Totally. Of yeah. And so I'm curious to, did the labels not care? Like if you tell them, oh, I got this placement, this placement, all this, you know, these songs, obviously people are valuing these songs and they're getting play and all that, but the labels, that wasn't enough for them? It was what opened up the doors to get into the meetings with them. And they did care. And that, and that was a great thing for us. At the same point, you know, I will say that in hindsight, we weren't the most current sound for mm -hmm. what industry was looking at. And anyone can go, you can go to mattmichaelizner.com. You can listen to the to the to that particular group of albums. It was by a group that I was in called Chasing Saints. And if you listen to it, uh, you'll hear music that is very, I guess my the best way that I would describe this, and again, keep in mind, this is like 2000, the later mid 2000s, okay? So 2006, 2008, 2010, that, that range. We were very much a vertical horizon meets collective soul meets matchbox so late which, 90s early 2000s exactly which stylistically was which not i common. love by the way it's like my music i love it i love it too and but stylistically that was not what was happening in the mainstream music world that's not what people people were signing in 2008 mm -hmm. but in 2008 that's the stuff that was getting heard in fact there are a number of groups that I can give you examples of that that are not big groups, but actually, you know, if anyone's familiar with groups like Vertical Horizon or Collective Soul, and you really pay attention to what you hear on, on TV shows and films, you hear their music a lot, mm -hmm. a lot, right? But they never became those big, you know, top 40 band. I mean, they, they had the little one or two hits back in the 90s, but their music was great for sync, especially in the, in the mid, later 2000s, stylistically, right? Because that, that music works great for a lot of different areas within the sync world. But it was not what was happening currently in the top 40 market. Mm -hmm. So at the same point, when I do have to take an honest assessment of what I was doing stylistically, it was working great for sync and it was not working great for what was uh, happening in top 40. And, it, and as I look back now, one of the things that I, that I, that I teach with and my own experience, of course, based on my own experience, but that I teach to people is that well, the nice thing about licensing is that, you know, if your music is not top 40, like my songs that I write will never be cut by Justin Timberlake or Beyonce, because that's just not what I enjoy writing. Uh, it's not what, it's just not what I listen to. It's not what I'm going to naturally do. And I don't want to kill myself writing a hundred songs, hoping that Justin Timberlake is going to finally record one. I want to write the music that I want to write and that I really enjoy spending time on. And, and the nice thing about sync is that, there's a lot of opportunity for lots of different genres and styles of music. And you only have to just start listening to the different TV shows and the different commercials that you're, you know, that you're in front of literally every day, uh, really over the next week or so to really get an idea of what's working stylistically in, in the licensing world. Totally. Yeah. And I, I mean, I love that because 
I, I know for me, like I could never change, like I wanted to be a certain thing because I wanted to be popular, but I just don't write like that, mm-hmm. you know? And so I had to write what I could write and be okay with this is me. And it may not be the popular thing right now. And, you know, so I built my little legion of fans and I didn't even get into the licensing, but, you know, there's two ways to go about it, right? You you can build your little legion of fans and you can have your little corner of the industry there, but that's a lot of hard work and it's worth it if you really want to be an artist or you can go and pursue sync and find the people that really value what you're already creating. And, you know, the thing is for me, I actually, for a long time, I never really viewed myself as an artist. I always saw myself as, I'm the, I'm the guy who, I work really good in a band environment. I'm really good, you know, standing off to the right or to the left of the singer and letting them front the show. But I'm also very good at the, on the, on the back end. I'm really good at, not to sound arrogant, but my skill set would be, you know, on the songwriting side and on the production side. Because that, to me, when I was growing up, I thought, well, I'm not going to be the front guy. I'm going to be the guy who's who's, you know, kind of putting it all together, you know, and, and now I look at like what I do in, in the sync world. And I, I totally view what I do as very much an artist because I can come into my studio and I can write a orchestral piece, big orchestral piece that's going to get used on a international film. Uh, and that's one, that's one big set of skills that I never went to music school, but that's one set of skills that I <laughs> sat around and developed long enough. And they take a long time to write those pieces. They don't happen quickly but I enjoy writing that because that's a challenge. But then at the same point, I also, I live in Nashville now. I left Los Angeles, moved back to Nashville. I love having other artists come in and sit in my studio with me and whether they're a pop artist or whether they're a country artist or whatever they're pursuing, I love writing that stuff with them and then doing the production. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then I love, of course, writing rock-based or just guitar-based instrumental tracks, which I get a lot of placements on those as well. And so stylistically, I get to cover a lot of ground artistically that I would not or that I never got to cover pursuing the artist path because when you're pursuing the artist path you really have to pursue one thing you have to be a little bit more homogenized so that mm-hmm. your fans understand your brand that's so yeah. true you can't be as much of a genre bender right and i see that a lot of times with people that are asking me about licensing like well i do a lot of different styles of music and i'm like that's Good. awesome that's, <laughs> that's even better for you most composers do most musicians actually do a wide variety of, of music it's just that when we're pursuing the artist path we know that we have to brand ourselves in one thing so we choose one little narrow niche and we head down that path but in the licensing world i mean i've done everything from acapella to bluegrass and, and these aren't little things i mean these are you know, I mean, I did acapella on a show called The, the, the Sing-Off. I did bluegrass on a number of shows, but one, a bit, one of the ones I've done a lot for would be Amish Mafia. I've done big orchestral pieces for big trailers and a lot of stuff for, you know, a bunch of the Amazon, uh, Amazon uh, new, newer Amazon movies and, and whatnot. And, uh, of course, rock-oriented stuff and pop and country-oriented stuff. So being able to cover a, a wide variety of styles, to me, is is a lot of fun. And I think that is one of the reasons why I really also like being more on the back end, not being, you know, probably from, from as, as, as a teenager, when I was moving forward in my career, I, I, I always, even when I was playing in my band, I was always in my basement writing and recording different styles of music that of course I would never present to the band, but I was always exploring other things. And what's nice is that the licensing path allows me to freely come into my studio and explore that knowing that there's always going to be an outlet for it. Yeah. And, and, and I know that, you know, in your video series, you talk about different paths, licensing paths that you can take. And I know over the years, some people have said to me, well, you know, I've gone the route of trying to like write to particular opportunities. Like mm-hmm. I go on something like taxi or something and I see there's these opportunities and I'm trying to write for those but I get frustrated because it's not really my style or, you know, and I just want people to like the music that I naturally write. And I know you've been successful with that. So, you know, if you could talk a little bit about like the different paths to licensing and and how you kind of guide artists into which path to take. Sure. I'll tell you you all a little story of of how I, 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 I converted along the way on how I was going to pursue things. So in, uh, I think it was around 2009, or the beginning of 2010, I really don't recall at this point anymore, but I was offered the gig writing for, it was season 11 of American Idol. So I, I jumped on it because I was working with all these composers for the previous number of years and, and I was definitely in, in that world of composing. And, and I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity. This would be my first TV show to write music for, right? 
and uh, and that worked out well. And and the company I was working for uh, asked me to start writing for another show. And so now I was working for two show, writing on two shows uh, a day. And I think within a month, I got asked to write a fourth third show. And so I was writing for three different TV shows at one time. And then it became this crazy pursuit because I was working on American Idol, where I was doing the tension beds that underscore whenever the contestant is standing in front of the judges and they make that really uh, yes. long, you know, thing where they're all looking at each other in the silence and God. all that stuff. So I was doing the tension beds for that season. I was writing what I call cinematic bluegrass for a show that only lasted for one season called Sarah Palin's Alaska. <laughs> and then I was, I was doing a acapella for uh, my first season that I did for a show called The Sing-Off, uh, which is an acapella competition show, just like American Idol. And, and I didn't see the light of day for about three months. And I was under so much stress. I actually developed a, a little health thing. Uh, it's not a big deal, but it's called alopecia. It's actually where you start losing hair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some people get that when they, when they get stressed. And I remember thinking, this is the worst thing in the world. This is not why I picked up the guitar. This is not the path that I chose because I was following the path of Michael, we need this and we need it by five. Michael, we need this. We need to have it by two. And it was, it was a great experience. I, I, I don't regret it. I would do it again. And in, in hindsight, if I could go back and go, okay, it's only going to be like <laughs> three months of hell, but do it, you know, because you're going to learn so much from it. But after that was done, I thought I will never do this again ever. I will never do this again. I didn't enjoy it. It got to be something that I didn't enjoy. Now I have friends who are musicians who love that. They love the challenge. They love composing to uh, requests. And some people are built that way. I'm not. So prior to that, I'd been having quite a bit of success with my songs anyway, just writing the music that I liked. And I thought, I'm just going to go back to that, but I'm going to scale it up to a whole new level. At that point, it was getting into 2011, and I was really changing my path, my pursuit from the band pursuit, you know, the record deal, to going, okay, now I'm gonna really focus on licensing. Licensing's always carried me through for the last number of years, paid my bills and whatnot, but now I'm gonna really pursue it. I'm gonna make this the career now. And when I did that, the, the, the game changed, and then I started learning a lot more about, about really how to deliver music. And that's really when I started developing my process, which I call the four-step plan, the licensing success. It's just a four-step process. So that, that four-step process came about through many years of experimentation and, and, and whatnot. But as far as when it comes to writing the music that you're passionate about versus pursuing uh, what they call briefs or requests, I'm no longer a fan of pursuing the briefs for a number of reasons. The one thing you have to keep in mind, especially when you're a part of some of these organizations, and I'm not saying anything negative about any, any of them in general, but in my experience, the licensing world works very, very, very quickly. If there's a request that goes out, they really have that need within the next 24 hours. So when you're getting these briefs from these other agencies, you know, uh, we're looking for this, send it in by Thursday, and it's, you know, the previous week's Wednesday, that to me is one of those things where I, I, I don't have a lot of, I don't personally put a lot of stock in that particular brief because it's been my experience that that request was already fulfilled before you probably even saw that. So that's, again, that's just my experience. The licensing world works very quickly. And the other thing that I've learned is that, and this is one of the things that, you know, you just brought up where I talk about the past, the placement. That's actually one of the very first things I talk about in the very first video in this series. I talk about the four paths to placements. And the very first path to placement that a lot of musicians think about is directly to music supervisors. I just want to get, you know, my music in front of music supervisors, you know, and that's great. And I totally understand that. That's exactly how I started. However, what I've learned over the years, and I've been teaching this, I've been speaking about licensing for, I mean, well over a decade uh, at conferences and whatnot. But the thing that I've learned is that while a lot of musicians know what it is and they know how profitable it can be. The reality is that they don't understand the business enough to actually fully represent their music to a music supervisor. They don't understand that if a music supervisor is offering you a contract, a licensing deal, and it's two o'clock on a Thursday, they're going to send you an email at two o'clock on a Thursday because they need it by five o'clock that Thursday. You need to be able to check your email quickly. You need to be able to download that contract and read it and agree to it or renegotiate something and come to an agreement within the next two or three hours. Because if, if they don't have that deal by five, they're going to go elsewhere. This is a right. very fast. You don't have time to call up your music lawyer and ask no. them to look it over. Yeah. You don't. And so for me, you know, I, I've been doing this a long time 
and I, I, I managed my entire contract, I'm sorry, my entire catalog. I administered my catalog fully until around 2011. And since 2011, I haven't touched administering my catalog. I work solely with a group of libraries, various portions of my catalog are in various libraries. I know a lot of musicians don't like to do this. They don't like the thought of giving away, you know, I don't want to give up the rights to my music. Well, you're not giving up the rights to your music. You just don't understand publishing enough to understand how you're not giving up the rights to your music. Just because you're signing your music over to a, someone to administer your catalog for you doesn't mean you're giving up anything. At the same point, you have to understand a little bit of the business so that you can let a team of people market and promote your music catalog for you. And for those who are new to this, I'll give you the best analogy that I've, I've ever been able to come up with when it comes to music licensing, because we all understand real estate. I think at this point, it's safe to say that most of us understand how real estate works and licensing and real estate are the exact same business model. Okay. The only difference is that when you're selling a house, when you sell it, you leave and you don't go back to it, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's that, that whole deal is closed, but with licensing, when you are licensing your song, you still own it. It's kind of like, it's kind of like renting out your house, but you still get to live there, right? And you never get to see the guests. But as far as the actual business of it, it's just like real estate. Most people, if you're going to sell your house, you're going to want to get the best deal you can for it. Well, how do you get the best deal? Well, you bring in a team of individuals who know the market, who have their marketing and distribution channels in place. And those are called realtors, right? And you bring them in and they're going to get a percentage of that house sale. But at the same point, you get to continue on with your daily life and not worry about selling your house. They're going to do all the work for you. So you can go to work. All you have to do is keep it clean so that if they come, they need to show it throughout the day, you know, they, they, they go and they show a clean house. But other than that, you move on with your life and all is well in the world. But the problem, that's exactly what happens with licensing. When you have a team, a licensing company, like a publisher or a music library working your music catalog for you, you get to continue on with your life as usual, getting back into your studio, writing the music you want to write, having a great time doing it, and then you hand it off to a team. Now they have to pay their bills. They have to have incentive. So of course, they're going to take a percentage of the licensing fees, but you're not giving them your music. They don't suddenly own your music. And that's a big thing that we have to understand as musicians. And that comes with even taking a step further back to just understanding the basics of publishing and songwriting rights. When you write a song, you were always a songwriter for it. When you were, uh, and, and you were also automatically the publisher for it until you hand over the publishing or the administration rights to another company. And then at that point, you just have to look at the contract and make sure that you agree to the terms. I never give up the rights to my music, but I will let a company market and promote my music for three years. Mm -hmm. They need to. They need to have that incentive. And three years in the licensing world is a very fair uh, term. Here's why. Because we have to look beyond just America. We have publishers in all these other countries. That is an incredible, in fact, I'd say probably a little bit more than half of my income comes from international song royalties. Mm. We have to look at the market as a whole. And, and when you have sub-publishers in other countries, they don't just suddenly ingest your music into their catalog. There's a process. And, and if, I, if I deliver my music, say, right now to my publisher today, it probably will not be available for probably about another two to three months. It's just how long it takes to go through the system, get up into, the, into their system for the team to be familiar with the, with the record, for you know, everything to be in place. And it'd be the same thing with a record label. You finish the record today, the record label takes a couple months to get everything in place to release that record, for everyone to get familiar with it, to understand what's in there, to get all the, everything in, in, in place. So then once that's up in the, in the, say, the American world with my American publisher, then it goes to all the sub-publishers in other countries. That could be a six to nine month process. So the reality is if we say, well, I'm not going to sign anything longer than a year. Okay. You've not given any of the people working your catalog, any of the team members, any incentive to work your song. Mm. Because by the time it finally gets ingested into the final sub publisher's catalog, that deal is over and it's going to come right back out. So you really need to look at this as I, I think a three year deal is extremely fair. After three years, the rights revert back to you or you can continue on. So you're never giving something up. At the same point, this is just licensing. So 
they're only representing your song for placements. You can put your music up on streaming. You can sell it. You can do whatever you want. They are not a record label. So they're not taking on the record label responsibilities. And it's important to make that distinction. When you're licensing your music, the people who are, you're working with in the licensing world are not working in the music industry. So you don't have to worry about all these things conflicting with each other. They're not mutually exclusive. They, they each work separately from each other. Yeah. And I always say, you know, like 50% of something is way better than 0% of nothing. (laughs) Because if you don't know how to get these licensing placements and you don't have time, like say you had, you'd created 20 songs and then you spent all of your time trying to get them placed. You're not creating new music. And as licensors, we need to keep creating, right? Because like you said, feed the pipeline. So you're 100% correct. And, and to give you the, the thing with, with how I teach licensing is, you know, I have my process. Other people teach it. They, they share their process. Their processes are different than mine. I'm never going to be guilty of telling someone to do something that I haven't done. And for me, when I handed my catalog over to a publisher, and again, I, I look at it as a team. This is a team event, by the way. I'm a, I have a relationship with every single person at, at those companies. I have their numbers in my cell phone. I have their emails in my, in my email. I have direct contact with them. One of the worst things that you can do as a musician is go to a website, sign up, log in, and suddenly be working with a company. Mm. You're a number. Actually, you don't even know who you're contacting with, who you're in touch with over there. If you don't have a personal connection with the people working your music, then, then you're with the wrong company or with the wrong team. You're actually not even really with a team. You're really with a music collection agency that's just trying to collect music. At the same point, we also have to think of the gatekeepers. You know, it, Anyone can just go sign up for some of these different companies and upload their music. Oh, I'm being represented by this company now. Did they really even listen to your music? Do they really even know what that's good for? Did, are they inputting the metadata for it? I guarantee you they're not. Are they having you input the metadata? Most likely. Do you know what metadata is? Do you understand how editors and supervisors are searching for music right now? What the key terms that they're using right now are? What, what's popular? What's trending? If you don't know those answers, then you should not be doing this yourself. And that's the thing. I hear from a lot of musicians who are like, I tried licensing my music and I sent my music out and I never heard back from anyone. Of course you didn't. Of course you didn't. You didn't deliver music to them in any way that made their life easier or supported what they were working on currently, right? You just bombarded them and blasted them with your songs. Of course you're not going to hear back. So, so there is a process and, and it's, it's important to keep in mind. I don't want to, I'm, I'm not trying to sound harsh about this, but I do want to make sure that your listeners, everyone listening understands that we're used to as musicians, a certain pursuit. Okay. So, and I call it the traditional music industry path. And that path is a two-step process. We finish our song. Okay. We just finished our record and now we're going to send it out. We're going to send it out to A&R guys. We're going to send out the publishers. We're going to send it out to record. I mean, sorry, uh, radio stations. We're going to send it out to maybe some magazines and get some reviews. It's a two-step process. Finish the song, send it out. All right, package it up into a CD, you know, and of course send the CD out. That is not the way that the licensing world works. In the licensing world, it's actually a four step process. For step one, of course, is finish your song. Step four is send it out. The two steps in between are what creates the value so that the editors who are sitting at an edit bay in a studio and they're in, in, in a, you know, a little cool vibed out studio and wherever they're at in probably California or something like that, they're watching a scene and they're, they have a list from the director or the producer of what style of music they're looking for in this particular scene. These decisions have been made really before these scenes were even filmed, to be honest with you, because music is the last step of the process. Mm-hmm. So this isn't just something that happens on a whim. There was a lot of thought put into every single thing that they're looking for in every particular scene. So there's an editor who's looking at a sheet of paper that says, okay, in this scene, we're looking for music that's happy and upbeat and, and very youthful, and, but it's got to have a female vocal and they want a glockenspiel in it. Okay, all right, so the director wants a glockenspiel, that's fine, and a ukulele, okay. So, so the editor now is gonna go into his search function and he's gonna type in glockenspiel, ukulele, female, youthful. He's gonna type in these keywords. And he's going to search through hundreds of thousands of songs. And if your song does not have this type of descriptive metadata attached to it, it will not show up in their search. You will never get your song license. So that's one of the key things that that we don't have to do in the traditional music pursuit. We don't have to add metadata to our songs when when we send it out to a a radio station or to a a magazine to get a, a review for our record, right? The other thing too is we have to also understand the role of our of our editor 
you know, there's dialogue happening in the scene. Maybe the editor needs some instrumental section underneath the dialogue. And then once the dialogue ends, they need to then go into the vocal version. And you hear this when you start listening to TV shows and commercials and stuff like that. You're going to hear sections where there's a lot of instrumental music and then it's going to transition right into say like the big chorus. Well, how did that happen? It's because there was an instrumental version and there was a full version, or maybe there was an acoustic version and then there was a full version and the editor is going to line them up and right at that, up that right moment, he's going to do a crossfade between them. That's the value of what I call delivering valuable content. That's actually step two of my process. And that's what makes your, again, your, your music extremely licensable. Now, most musicians don't understand this, so they don't send out their music with metadata. They don't send out their music with what I call the valuable content, with the alternate mixes that make the editors and the re-recording mixers jobs extremely easy. Uh, let's take it a little step further here. Re-recording mixers, they're the final step of the process. They're the ones who mix all the dialogue from the actors. All the sound design, the sound design is, would be like the car driving, the sound of the car mm -hmm. driving down the street, uh, the rustling of the leaves, the feet on, on, on a wood surface, you know, all those little sounds of like forks and spoons when they're eating dinner and stuff like that, that's sound design. So they're gonna record the actor's audio, they're gonna record, they're gonna mix the sound design and then they're gonna mix the music together. But most TV shows, commercials and films are mixed in 5.1 surround. We mix audio and stereo. So the next question I have for these people who are like, oh, I tried to do this, but I failed is, did you send them your stims? No, I didn't. Well, okay. How do you expect someone who's mixing something in 5.1 surround to mm. suddenly throw in your stereo mix and actually get it to fit with the, with the rest of the audio? You need to be able to deliver your stims to them. So there's, again, this is a whole other world. It's very, very simple. But we have to understand that there's a process to get us to the results that we want to get. And that process is completely different than the traditional process that we're used to when it comes to the traditional music path, which is finish our song, have a stereo mix of it, and then just send it out and expect people to figure out what to do with it. That's not the way that the licensing world works. Yeah, I know. And I think that, you know, nowadays people are recording so much from home and it is possible to do all of this. Oh, yeah. But they may feel totally overwhelmed with like, what the heck is a stem and, you know, all that stuff. Sure. So obviously you cover that in, in your licensing course when you're working with students, right? Yeah, I do. I cover every aspect of it. And here's, here's the thing. This is the reason I created my licensing course is I spoke, I started speaking on at conferences, I think around 2000 and maybe 2009. First started speaking at some conferences out in LA. I was starting to have quite a bit of success and people were hearing about me. And I would speak on licensing. I'd go to these conferences. I'd listen to people talk about, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I'd get up there and, and, and um, you know, it'd be later in the day and, and people would start to fall asleep. And I remember one of the conferences I spoke at was I said, you know, today you've learned how to wake up at, you know, when you wake up at three o'clock in the morning and you have that great idea and how you can use this program to record it and, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And you can do it quickly and everything is so easy, you know, now. But when you wake up at nine o'clock in the morning, you know, after you went back to bed, and you have that song, you wake up at nine o'clock in the morning, how do you deposit it into your bank account? Mm. I want to show you how to do that. And I'd see everyone's heads pick up. And I was like, oh, okay, well, this is obviously resonating. And then I would speak at more conferences and I'd see these people talk about licensing. And it would really annoy me because they would talk about what music licensing was. They wouldn't actually talk about how to do it. It was just more of what it is, what it is, what it is, and how profitable it is, but what it is. And it would really annoy me. Of course, yeah, I was always helping my friends get into this and sharing with them the, the processes that I've used and seeing them you know, have success. So when I created my course a couple of years ago, my focus was for it to be a one and done program. This is all you need. This shows you every process. If, if you've never, if you don't even record your own music, you can go through my course. You can sit with your engineer and your producer. You can pull up your laptop and you can show them two or three videos in, in module three that will show them exactly what they need to burn for you. I mean, you can just, they can watch it and in, you know, five to seven minutes, they'll know exactly what they need to give you. But, but for me, just to give you a little bit more of a, a clear idea on how I approach everything, since I was a teenager, I've learned that if I create systems, processes, and I follow them, they will work. And that's, that's what helped me become a better guitar player over time. I, you know, I, I, I would map out my, my rehearsals and my, my practices and, and, you know, and that's how I would know, be able to get faster and more adept at the, at the instrument. And probably why I was able to, you know, have a s session career as a young 20 year old, you know, musician in Nashville and then of Los Angeles as well, but systems work. And so when I really started focusing on licensing, 
I didn't want to put a lot of time into this. I didn't want to have to sit and always figure this out every time I figured out, after, every time I wrote a song. So I just implemented systems. And this four-step process is a four-step system. Now, step one, which is to build your catalog, has multiple little steps in it, but you start at step one and you go all the way down. And then when you're done with that, you are now automatically now in step two of the process. And then that has a bunch of different process. You know, you have to create your alternate mixes. Here are the alternate mixes that generally uh, get used a lot. Now, not every song can generate all those, you know, mixes, but you can at least get three or four alternate mixes from every song. Then the next step for in, the, in step two is to create what I call your cut down mixes. Those are your 30, 60, and 15 second mixes. And those are what are, are used in commercials. All right, very easy to do, not hard, but that's still step two of the process. And then the third part of that step two is to create the stems. And creating a stem is very simple. If you need to create a drum stem and you have your session in front of you, mute every instrument that's not a drum and burn it to a stereo mix. Now you have nothing but your stereo drums exactly as they appear in your full mix. Then if you need to do a guitar stem, you mute every instrument that's not a guitar and you burn it down to a stereo mix. You can burn stems in literally two to three minutes have all your stems done. That's the thing, it's interesting. I think some musicians get so caught up thinking like, oh, I don't know if I can do stems. Yeah, you can. It takes two to three minutes <laughs> once you learn how to do them. And I show every step of that process, of course, in, in, the, in, in, the, in, in my course. But then it literally is a paint by numbers process. Okay, now once you're done creating the alternate mixes, the cut down mixes and the stems, now you are automatically in step three of the process, which is metadata. And there I have a whole spreadsheet. We cover like literally every aspect of metadata that your editors, that your music supervisors, that your music libraries, that your PROs, performing rights organizations, all that information that needs to be captured because that's what gets put into a cue sheet. Cue sheets are how you're paid your royalties in the licensing world. So literally it's again, it's a paint by numbers process. You literally just go through uh, that spreadsheet per song, fill out each column. Now you have all the metadata that's necessary. And then you move on to step four. So it is a paint by numbers process that really, once you've done it one or two times and you, and you understand how it goes, it's very, very simple. Licensing in music is not hard, but you have to understand how to do it. And the entire process that I've created has been successful for me because it's so value-based towards my end users. It's all about providing value for the editors, music editors, for the uh, music supervisors, and for the individuals, my team at, at, at a music library or a publisher who's administering the catalog. And when you're able to deliver value to them and make all of their jobs so easy, you cannot not have success licensing your songs. It's impossible. Bam, that's awesome. Yeah, and I, that's so true. I mean, anytime that someone can make my life easier, I'm like working with them again, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. No. And, and, and that's what, to me, you know, like I hate guessing in, in the licensing world, you know, just in the music pursuit, you know, music, music's a, look, anytime, if, if you're listening to this and you record at home, actually, let's not even talk about recording. Let's, let's look at it like this. If you're listening to this and you got in your car today, uh, you might not realize it, but I bet you every single person listening to this, when you get in your car, you follow the exact same process. And it might be slightly different from everyone else's, but you follow the exact same process unconsciously. Like, for example, when I get in my car, I sit in my car. The very first thing I do is I turn it on. That's the very first thing I do. Once my car is on, then I put the seatbelt on, you know, and then, I, then if it's hot, I might turn on the AC, but it's, I do it in this particular order. And then, you know, then we go through the process of pulling out of the, you know, parking space and, and moving. Right. But but we do this process. Well, that's my system for driving a car. Yours might be slightly different, but it works and it gets you where you need to go. We all have systems and we do these unconsciously. When it comes to licensing or anything in any career that, that we're pursuing, if we can create systems that get us to that goal, that don't require a lot of thought, I mean, it requires thought putting it together, but once we have it down, then we just follow the process. That's how we have success. As, as I've been talking with Bree, right before I came on for this interview, I went to Starbucks at the bottom of my hill and I got myself a green tea latte. And I've been to Starbucks all over the world from Shanghai to you know, Germany to er, er, virtually every state in America. And every green tea latte tastes the same, virtually. <laughs> Other countries it might be a little different because they're getting their, their matcha green tea somewhere. But the process of creating that green tea latte from Starbucks is the same. That's why I can go to the same one here in America, or not the same one, different ones here in America, and it will always say the same because they have a system in place. And it's the same thing with McDonald's or any fast food restaurant. You know, teenagers run these places pretty much, but they all follow the exact same prices, they, the, the same process. That's how we have that consistency from, from location to location. 
And that's and, why and, people buy franchises because exactly. they know it's successful. They're going to be given a system. They're just going to follow it and then they can just yeah. start making money. <laughs> so essentially I didn't even think about it, but you know, the, my licensing process is like a franchise. <laughs> yep. Yep. I love that. I love that. And so the last thing I want to talk about is why is this the right time to quote buy into such a franchise? Because right now, you know, this is being recorded during what I am calling the COVID era, where yeah. as musicians, we cannot perform live in person in general. Most of the time we are doing a lot of live streaming, but that doesn't usually pay as well. There's a lot of things that are frustrating as a musician, but I know that, you know, you're talking about, and you're absolutely right, that the content world for TV, movie, you know, especially like things that are put out by different content creators like Netflix, you know, oh, originals yeah. and stuff are just going crazy right now. So I would love for you to just talk about like why this is the absolute best time to get into licensing. Sure. So I'm, I'm in a fortunate position in that a lot of my friends are very successful and very well-known musicians, or they are also musicians who play for very well-known musicians. Of course, now living in Nashville, a lot of my friends play with huge country stars, you know, huge. And they're all out of work, completely out of work. And they don't know when they're going back to work. And it's really a shame. And, you know, it's funny because during the COVID thing is when I, I'd say more than any time in my life, I've had my friends from California, from Nashville, my music friends, professional musicians reach out to me during the last couple of months going, Michael, I got to learn how to do this. I got to learn how to get my songs licensed. Because if anything, the COVID pandemic has been a wake up call for a lot of musicians to actually get their back end passive income stream in order. Okay. We can, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but we've all seen this year how it only takes one little thing like this for everything to dry up. And I mean, my friends are hurting because they don't have a backup. They don't have a back end income stream happening. But here's the thing that's also interesting, especially in like March and April. And you can look this up. I, I have the stats, although I don't have them in front of me and I don't want to go looking for them while I'm talking to you at the moment. But the stats for like Netflix and Disney Plus, I think Disney Plus started in October, I know, November of 2019. So we're here in July of 2019. I'm sorry, 2020. So it's been like seven months, right? Eight months, I guess. Disney Plus, I think, is already over 50 million subscribers. Yeah, I think that's uh, what I grabbed the stats from your email that you sent out last week yeah. and put it in my own email. I think I sent out a few days ago. And yeah, they're they're massive. Massive. And in fact, I even sent out an email recently. Uh, I think it may have actually been that same email yep. where I yep. sent out the list of all the current shows that are in production, the, when their productions are starting again, but the shows that have been uh, picked up for another season as well as the shows that have been canceled. And when you go down that list, it's pretty astronomical. I mean, it, it, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows. There's so much production going on. And it even shows you the, the, the networks that they're on, CBS, ABC, Amazon, you know, Netflix, you know, Disney Plus, whatever. So it actually shows you, you know, uh, who, who's doing these. Uh, and, and it's an astronomical amount of content that's being produced. Well, people right now are craving entertainment. And we even see that in the last 10 years alone. I know this stat off the top of my head. Last 10 years alone, the number of TV shows has increased by 174%, the number of scripted TV shows. Now that's not including movies. It's not including documentaries. It's not including like the reality TV shows, you know, these are scripted TV shows. Wow. So, so the amount of content is exploding. On top of that, we also have to look at where the licensing world is going in the future with things such as uh, YouTube people who are just creating content from home who are using music. Well, that those are called micro licenses, by the way. That's a whole other conversation, but it, it still is the process of sync licensing. If you're watching a YouTube creator who decides that they want to use like a, a Beyonce song, you know, in the background of, of his video or her video, that's called a micro license. And that is a, that just like anything, that is a new a thing that's really coming to prominence here in the licensing world, something to definitely stay on top of, but also another reason to, to get into it. So the reason why this is the great, a great time to get into licensing is because A, it creates a back-end revenue stream. We cannot just as musicians focus on only collecting our income from doing shows because now we've seen how that can end in a heartbeat. But at the same point, TV shows, I'm, I'm getting paid now for, for work that I've done over the last 14 years. I mean, and I, I'm very thankful about this, but the COVID 
epidemic has not affected me in any way. Well, and so many shows, people are binging like old yeah. shows. You know what I mean? Like Friends is super popular with the younger generation. Like all these shows that, you know, The Office, like these shows that have been around forever are now like coming back and people are like, oh, I have time to now finally watch this show. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> people have nothing but time on their hands. So so this is this is a good time. And also, by the way, productions have started up again. I, I have, uh, again, like I, I said, I'm very fortunate in my career that I've been able to work on a lot of shows and I have a lot of friends in the industry who, you know, on, 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 on social media, Instagram and stuff like that. And I'm seeing them posting uh, on their Instagram stories. Now they're back in production. They're back on set. Now they're wearing their masks and they're wearing their face shields and stuff like that. And it just shows that the productions have started up now in our world as musicians, that's irrelevant to us with their, they're wearing face masks or face shields, but you know, because we get to work out of our home studios and we come into the process after the production. So we come into the process during post-production. The reason why I think that I really want to encourage musicians to really start considering sync as a, as, as a viable option to add to your income stream is because especially right now, it's going to take a little bit of time to learn this. You, you know, you, you got to you know, learn the process and you have to apply it to every song in your catalog. It's not going to happen in two days, but the productions that have started up now in another, you know, month or two months, they're going to start going into post-production. That's where we come in. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so we're in the summer of 2020 start focusing on licensing now so that you can start perfectly positioning yourself and your music for when all these shows that are now jumping back into production. I mean, they, they they got a backlog and people are craving entertainment, you know? So when all these things start jumping into um, post-production come September, October, November, you can be in the game. You can actually be in a, a contender to get your songs placed. And it's not just about blindly sending out your music to a supervisor and hoping that they figure out what to do with it. That is the reason why you will never hear from someone. And that's the problem. A lot of musicians are like, well, I sent out my music and I never heard back. Well, what did you do? Well, I sent them an email with a link to my song. All right. You're not going to hear back. You didn't deliver music to them in any way that they could use it. Yeah, totally. And this is the time for you to get your, your crap in order yeah. and get your metadata settled for all the stuff you already have. Get your stems, you know, follow Michael's process. Yeah. And like he said, you will be ready and, you know, and, and be able to, to get connected with libraries and publishers that really and can. Work. And one thing that I would like to add to every, everyone listening is that, uh, you know, it does sound good. This sounds exciting. Uh, licensing is, is a fun world. It is exciting. Definitely. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I mean, it, it does require work. You have to write good music. Your productions have to sound good. You can't hand in demos with out of tune vocals and stuff like that. You know, you're playing, uh, uh, you're playing with, in, you know, in, in the big leagues, you're playing with big productions that spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on, on their, on their shows and whatnot. So you are playing in the big leagues. The nice thing about it though, is that your music is valued and you are paid accordingly, which, which is a wonderful thing for us as musicians, because there really are very few other outlets where we do get paid accordingly, both on the upfront fees, the upfront licensing fees. And of course, then on, on the back end royalties at the same point, the other thing that's wonderful about licensing. And, and this is a part of my story that for a long time, I looked at my career as a failure because you know, I went to Nashville and failed. I went out to LA and I failed. I never got the record deal. But in hindsight, I look at it and I go, I'm very thankful that I landed into the licensing world because it gives me an opportunity to do the stuff that I love. I still get to come into my studio and play guitar. And that's what I love to do and write and record music. The wonderful thing about it for you is if you did not have success in your path or, or whatever, or you didn't get to the point that you wanted to, or, you know, maybe someone said something stupid like, oh, you're too old or, or whatever, you know, or your music's not top 40. The great thing about licensing is that this world accepts you and this, this world it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter if a record label turned you down or anything like that. What matters is one very simple thing. It matters whether or not your music complements and enhances the story and the emotion that's happening on screen. Nothing else matters. What you look like, what clothes you wear, it's completely irrelevant. I'm so glad you said that because um, we just had an episode very recently about not letting your age hold you back. And, you know, the people that listen to this show they're of all ages, of all backgrounds, of all genres, and yeah. there is a place for you in licensing. So that's exciting, exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. And 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 uh, and just just one one little one little, and then I'll I'll be quiet here. But but one little um thing. If you take anything away from this, I, I will give you one assignment right now. This is the first assignment that I give anyone because of course a lot of people will will ask you know well well is is my music good enough for licensing or anything like that? Uh, where does my music fit in? Here's the thing. Over the next couple of days, 
when you get home from work or, or, or if you're just hanging out at the house in the afternoon and you're sitting on the sofa watching some TV, I want to encourage you, give yourself a half hour to an hour a day for a couple days to close your eyes, turn on the TV, close your eyes. It doesn't matter what you watch. Find some random show that you've never seen before for all I care. Turn on the TV, close your eyes, and just listen to the music going on in the background. When it gets to a commercial, don't get up sit there and listen through the commercial because commercials will pay you a lot of money. Commercials are probably going to be some of your biggest money makers. So pay attention to the music that you're hearing in a commercial. And you're going to hear that as you do this over the next couple of days, you will hear that the majority of the music that, that you hear on TV is not the music that you hear on the radio. You're going to hear a wide variety of music uh, across multiple different styles, across even multiple different eras. You might watch a show that's, that's using a lot of throwback 1980s music. You might hear something that's using stuff that's like jazz from the 1920s, right? All of that stuff is created by people just like you and me, musicians who are just independent musicians writing the music that we love to write, and it's getting licensed for these shows. So start listening to TV. Stop watching it. Give yourself some time every day to just listen to it. Okay, guys, that's your assignment. Not usually do you get assigned homework to go watch TV or listen to TV. So I hope you enjoy it. Check out some different shows you would never normally watch and then watch some of the ones that you love and don't watch them. Just listen because it's going to be super valuable. And then your second assignment is to go sign up for Michael's video series. It is really good. I've watched it front to back several times. Very, very helpful. He talks specifically about the four paths and metadata and all those important things and what kind of songs they're looking for and licensing and everything. So go to femusician.com slash Michael, femmusician.com slash Michael and get into that video series. Do it ASAP because it's only going to be around for a few more days. Thank you so much, Michael. This has been awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Bree. I always love talking to you. Me too. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.